today, of course, we're chatting with Mark Delory, who probably needs no introduction to you, but since we're on video, I will tell you all about him. So Mark retired from Western in July of 2015, kind of, right? Um, after serving as a financial aid director for over 30 years, which we're not all at Western, I know, but during his time here, he co-founded the CETA Scholars Program, which is the world's largest higher education initiative for foster youth. He was the first higher education professional to receive the Distinguished Service and Leadership Award from the National Association for the Education of Homeless Children and Youth and has received many other awards. Um, currently, he works part-time as the WMU Foundation Scholars Advisor, which is a scholarship program that he initiated to assist outstanding students who have overcome challenges and demonstrate um, great resilience. So I think we all know that Mark has always had a strong commitment to all of underrepresented populations and students and he and his work have clearly had a huge impact on Western students and at the administrative level. level. Um, so we are excited that you're here, Mark. So thanks for joining us and we'll make you embarrassed some more. So I, I do have a million questions ready for you. Of course, we will invite questions from the audience, but I thought we would start with just the work stuff first. So sure. is that okay? First of all, I gotta say, I, I, if I could just say hi. Uh, yeah. Richard, I see you there, you're hiding. Kayla, Cecilia, who's that kid, Ashley? Is that? You don't know her. So, Jordan, how you doing? So, some of my kids are here. Good to see you. Yo. <laughs> are these current kids or former well, kids? They're they're forever they're kids. Forever kids. So, this is true. Yeah. We we have that in common. We have a co kid uh, in Ashley. Um. Well, I let's jump into your kids then. So I know. Go ahead. Were you going to share a picture? Yeah, I the, will. The, yeah. Okay. We should share with, let's see. Can you all see that? Or what are you seeing, I guess, is the better question. Can you blow it up? Are you seeing my work? In w, but it's so tiny. <laughs> <laughs> let's try again. It might be tiny still. What do we got now? Now you might be seeing other things. Still tiny kids. <laughs> you might need to zoom in on the graphic. I'll work on it. No more. We'll, we'll show you again later. <laughs> and now, we have to stop sharing. Oh boy. Well, now you're seeing Chris fly. <laughs> Let me see. That's not gonna work. Yeah, we, were, we were saying before it got started that after a year on, right? on Zoom and all these platforms, we're still trying to figure out the technology. You can zoom in on the graphic if you pinch away with your fingers, um, if you're a, a viewer of it right now. No. I'm saying for people on the call, you can zoom in on it to see the people. Got it. So. I need to get out of the screen so I can stop sharing. But let's, let's go to questions and I'll let Mark talk and then I'll work <laughs> on that. How's that sound? <laughs> Sure. Mark, can you start by just telling us, obviously, the whole pandemic has uh, impacted everyone and with your work with students and the foundation scholars, tell us how the year has gone and how your work and the, your kids have been impacted by this whole crazy year. 
Oh boy. Uh, yeah, well, it was a year ago that uh, everybody kind of went home. We started doing everything by Zoom. Uh, when the new students showed up this fall, we still had in-person class, the first year seminar class uh, with the foundation scholars, but everything else was basically on Zoom. Uh, we had so many restrictions on getting together that this year's freshmen had just a very different experience. Uh, we, well, the students themselves a few years ago started referring to it as the FS fam, the Foundation Scholar family. And I think this year, a lot of that was lost, I'm afraid, with the new freshmen. They didn't have as many opportunities to get together. We couldn't have pizza parties or movie nights or pasta dinners or any of that. So it uh, was quite a bit more of an isolated year for the, for the new freshmen. And uh, uh, I think the upperclassmen too were kind of missing all the interaction that, that we usually have. And I think this fall, then we're going to have to kind of wait and see for the people who are freshmen this year, you know, sort of how much ground we can make up in terms of getting everybody together. So, a difficult year. The, the other thing, though, too, yeah, the, the other thing that uh, I kind of noticed academically was that the seniors had a harder time adjusting to online classes than the freshmen. The freshmen came in and they just thought, well, this is, you know, this is college. And so, they just did their usual, you know, fantastic work. And out of 10, um, three of them ended up with 4.0s for the semester. And uh, another four of them were above 3.8. So um, they did great. They had a great semester that academically. From, that from school or from ending last year all online? That was in, in the fall semester. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what what about on prospective students? I know you just got done selecting the new mm -hmm. foundation scholars for 2021. How did that yeah. go? Went great. Um, we have uh, we had record number of applications this year, which was good. We had uh, we've selected people from Michigan, from Illinois, from Kentucky, and from Pennsylvania. So I think word's getting out, and, and uh, we're kind of casting a bigger net than we did before for students. And we have just another great, great group of students. Uh, I've been able to talk to most of them now, call them. And uh, they, as usual, they readily accept the scholarship and uh, we're excited to be coming this fall. So looking forward to that. Exciting time. Um, Can I say something about the, the students please. who are graduating this year, too? Say whatever you want um, throughout this whole thing. This is all Okay, about <laughs> well, we, we only get about, you know, 10 students a year. And, uh, you know, this year, they all graduated, as usual. But uh, we also had, in that small group, uh, one presidential scholar and four were inducted into Phi Beta Kappa this year. So that uh, it's a pretty good record of, of achievement for a small group of kids. Talented bunch. Very good. How did they, uh, the virtual graduation, probably <laughs> hard for them, huh? Yeah, I'm not sure virtual graduation is anybody's favorite. No. But uh, we're going to, we're going to try to organize a picnic for everybody. And uh, we'll be all socially distanced and outdoors, but we'll still have everybody get together. Perfect. So I, uh, we've made you talk about work. And I, I think I've figured out the picture. I'm gonna hold off and I'll show it in a little bit just so I don't okay. make anything else crazy yet. Um, but we've been doing these to talk obviously about Western and what's going on with you at Western, but we also wanted to get to know Mark a little bit. So, and your memories of working at Western. So if you will go with me on that journey, I'll ask you a few questions. And the rest sure, of you, sure. if you have questions, feel free to put them in. But I am guessing, Mark, that when you were growing up and people asked you what you wanted to be, financial aid director did not come to mind. <laughs> what was, what was not on the did list, you think no. you were going to do? And how did you end up working in financial aid? Well, uh, yeah, no one except Ashley 
ever wanted to grow up to be in financial aid. She's the only person I know that did that. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up out in the country and I knew that if I couldn't be a professional fisherman or baseball player, that uh, I was looking at something, you know, outdoors, geology or something. And I took the, when I took the Hooter interest test to tell me what I should be when I grow up, uh, it told me I should be a farmer. So um, I, I still have a big garden, but uh, uh, the farming kind of had to take a back seat. And it's funny about that because I took it a couple of years ago when the students in class took it and it no longer said I should be a farmer after, you know, 45 years in higher ed. It told me that I should be an agriculture professor. So that's what, uh, that's what happens when you get stuck out of campus too long. That is true. And I have done that sort of thing myself. Um, what are you growing? Are we growing anything yet? Uh, tomatoes. We'll have some onions this year, some potatoes. Got uh, some apple trees going. Oh, nice. Oh, zucchini. Don't forget the zucchini. Always zucchini. I like the apple trees though. How did you um, end up getting to Western? Because this is not where you started. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I was up at Northern and uh, for some family reasons, we kind of realized that uh, moving south was going to be a good thing. And uh, I was sitting at my desk one day and Judy Bailey called me up and she said, hey, Mark, how would you like to come down to Western? And uh, next thing you know, I'm, I'm down here as, uh, as the director of financial aid. And uh, it was uh, a great move, but uh, I, I came down because Judy gave me a call one day. Lucky us. <laughs> Good deal. So thinking back to the years that you've spent here at Western, is there, um, and I bet that we can guess, but maybe you have something you, we don't know. Is there something that you're most proud of that you've done during your time here? Uh, yeah, I'd say three things, actually. The uh, kind of playing a part in getting the CETA scholars started was uh, uh, was kind of a highlight. Um, along with that, sort of the, the work to restructure what we were doing financially uh, to allow undocumented students to enroll, both with direct funds and with opening up uh, all of the institution scholarships and uh, helping them enroll. And then uh, last but not least, uh, my, my current kids, the foundation scholars, to, uh, to get that started and watch that. Um, I think, I, I, you know, it, that's gone, I think, better beyond, it's gone better than anybody dreamt it would in terms of the success of the students. And, uh, you know, that, being with them on a daily basis, uh, watching them grow, watching them take on the university and and uh, succeed has been absolutely a joy. I, I've i shared the story with you before, but I remember the first, the <laughs> first round of foundation scholars were quite an adventure. And the day we selected the finalists, this very nice financial aid director gave me the coat <laughs> off his back because they hadn't turned the heat on in the <laughs> Honors College yet. And Mark saw me shivering uncontrollably, already in my own coat and boots and hat. <laughs> so you take care of everyone. We appreciate you. <laughs> Actually, from that group that we selected that day, uh, one of the people was Jordan, who's with us today. You might remember his video. He had the, the, uh, uh, the slam poet slam poem oh. video. That's uh, Jordan, who I think I can say this without breaking too many uh, FERPA laws. Uh, Jordan graduated then with a 4.0 uh, nice. in both uh, accounting and finance. So way to go, Jordan. And he's a poet. No, I didn't even know it. What's okay, Jordan doing now? Uh, now I'm working some contract work for a manufacturing company in Portage, doing some accounting stuff, helping them out. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah, thank you. 
and Mark is and, awesome. And he's, wait, and, and he's waiting. Can't. He's waiting for Josh to hire him. So yeah, yeah, that's right. I love it. Well, I know um, that you are not specifically doing CETA scholars, of course, anymore. But and some of us have heard or lived that story. Can you tell us though how that was founded? Uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, it's part of the lore of, of the program, huh? Uh, Penny Bundy, say hi, Penny. Raise your hand. Uh, Penny and Yvonne Unruh and I uh, had been talking about uh, foster youth and what we could do to, to assist them. And a program came up uh, sponsored by the state of Michigan at Star Commonwealth. Uh, there was a university freeze on hiring. So uh, Penny and I took a day off. We took a, an annual leave day, uh, got in my little miniature Saturn, you know, we drove to Albion for the program at STAR. And um, one of the people that spoke, who was the last speaker of the morning, was a guy by the name of John Sita, and uh, great speaker. And um, after he spoke, we went to lunch, and Yvonne and Penny and I are sitting there at the table in the cafeteria. And uh, this very tall gentleman comes and sits next to us, and he, uh, he had been the last speaker, John Sita, and he asked, you know, where we were from. We said Western. He says, oh, he says, I have all three of my degrees from Western. And uh, he had talked about his experience in foster care. And so it was just, it was one of those nice things where he came and sat down with us by coincidence. And uh, on the way home from the meeting, we decided we've got to do something. And, you know, the ideas were churning. And by the time we got back to Kalamazoo, we had it, I think we had it fairly well sort of flushed out, didn't we, Penny? <clears throat> yes, we did. It was, the car was full of ideas and I don't <laughs> remember the drive at all. All I remember was the great, there was this sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, sense of excitement and a kind of an urgency that we couldn't let another day go by without doing something to help these kids and to, to start a start something that would uh, uh, assist those those students who wanted to go to college. And when we heard the statistics, I know what really cemented it for me was the fact that 70% um, of students in foster care aspire to go to college, less than 10% make it to a college two or four year. And at that time, three to 4% were graduating high significant populations of those students were ending up on the streets, homeless, on drugs, in prison, or incarcerated, um, or unfortunately passed away from life on the streets. So we felt a real, a real sense of urgency. And what Mark failed to mention was the day we went over there, we broke the rules. We weren't supposed to be traveling, <clears throat> traveling on camp, off campus at all, which is why we took an annual, uh, an annual leave day. And then we were told, I was told by someone, well, you can't use an annual leave day for that. I found out, yes, they could. So we, we thought any minute they're gonna pull us over, you know, and yank us back to campus. But it's the, I think it's the one time in my life when I've flaunted against or, or railed against the rules because they didn't make sense. And I'm awfully glad that we did, that there was a vision there and uh, we grabbed onto it. It's been a wonderful, I think of my 30 years in higher ed, not all of it at Western, that's what my career led me to. And my, both my grandmothers were or orphans and my grandmother, one grandmother was a foster kid in 1921 Indiana foster care system. And so I'd always heard her stories. So there was a real heart for that as well as uh, an emotional heart for that as well as just a professional, I got to do something, we've got to do something. And thank yeah. heavens for Mark and Yvonne and their leadership in getting it started. Yeah, and I see Richard and Kayla here. Um, we've had so many outstanding grads from the program, so many people in the program that were just uh, amazing. And uh, it's been uh, just a joy to watch that grow like it did. 
And it's funny too, because I said something to John once, uh, because one of the first people we invited in then was John Sita to, to work with us on it. And I said to him later, I said, uh, so that was neat that you gave us your card and, and agreed to, to work with us. And he kind of laughed. He says, Mark, he says, I've given my cards out to hundreds of people. You're the only ones who ever called me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, amazing. But it, it actually worked. So. Yeah. I, I do remember that. You know, Mark, we used to say, you know, Mark, we used to say, if we're not careful, this might just work. And yeah. uh, in those early days, there were quite a few times when we think, okay, we got to make move this, we got to do this, we got to do this. And we knew it was all leading somewhere. We weren't sure what, what the baby was going to look like after it was birthed. <laughs> but I'm glad that, yeah. that it emerged. We've emerged into this, all the good work that has continued and is so vital and is so wonderful. And I, I'm just so proud of everybody and thankful for your involvement. Yeah. All that you've done. And, I, and I'm an old MBA. You know, I, I, when we structured it too, it was set up to be a program that would be self-funding. Uh, and that's, that's continued. It doesn't, it doesn't draw resources from the university. It, uh, it adds to the university by bringing these great students in. And uh, it does it in a, you know, the, the, the modern term is we, we do it in a sustainable way. So that was part of the, uh, the beauty of the program when it got rolling. So. So with all of these huge programs, do you have any um, really memorable, funny, whatever moments or stories that you feel comfortable sharing? <laughs> oh man, uh, yeah. How much time do we have? Um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful stories. You know, I remember. Uh, uh, well, the first group of students, the first couple of groups of students, uh, you know, with Richard and, and Kayla here, they were, they were in the first and second year of the program. You know, we were still trying to figure things out at that time. We were still putting everything together. And, uh, you know, they came in and just, like I said, they tore the place apart. They were doing well and succeeding. And, uh, uh, you know, that was pretty memorable, just seeing it, it actually work. This crazy idea that we had that, uh, that uh, played out well. Uh, some of the funny stuff, uh, you know, I'm, I'm half Irish, so I can tell funny stories all day. I'll skip them. But, uh, uh, there was, uh, I, I saw that he signed up, but I don't see him here. Michael Fombang, um, he had, uh, when he started, he told me he wanted to be a doctor. And, uh, now I love Michael, but you know, if, if you knew him back at that time, the odds of him becoming a doctor were pretty slim. And, I always told him, well, I'll help you under one condition, Michael. You know, when you become a doctor, you'll take care of me when I'm old. And he just kind of laughed at that. And when he called me to tell me that he had finished his MD program, that he was now Dr. Michael Fombang. And I asked him, so what specialty are you going to go into? He, he says, you're not going to believe it. I said, what? He said, gerontology. I said, yes. I've got, so I have my own gerontologist now to, uh, to take care of me in my golden years. <laughs> uh, Kayla can take care of me and is a is an occupational therapist when I'm falling apart some more. So, and Richard's got my finances under control. So oh, that. that's a great part about working with college students for sure. What is Ashley going to do for us? We'll ask her that in a little bit. Um, <laughs> I I noticed that Dr. Barnes put a question in here, and I I have this on my list, so we're just going to ask it right now. But I know. And I have seen, I remember my first year working with um, the medallion competition and sitting, it was at a time where I got to sat, sit on the selection committee and watching you just fight hardcore for a specific student who was, I believe he at the time was in foster care and had might've even been homeless, had siblings who he was taking care of, but I, you have always um, worked for these underrepresented populations and you don't just talk about it, like you actually do it. So tell us where that comes from and where, as Dr. Barnes puts it, what drives your motivation to support students? Um. That's a good one. Uh, uh, 
you know, I've been in financial aid forever. And uh, uh, the idea of helping everybody go to school that wants to is, is uh, sort of the challenge. And I think, you know, to make sure every student who wants to enroll can uh, successfully is uh, just sort of a constant goal. Uh, um, I, I, can, I can answer it partly this way too. Uh, I was speaking at a class a few years ago uh, with Sean Tenney, one of, one of her graduate classes. And she used a word when she was introducing me that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I always disliked the word passionate. And she talked about how passionate I am. And I, I know Tony's heard this before, but when she said it that day, it kind of clicked in my brain. Uh, I realized why uh, that word always annoyed me. It's because I'm also very passionate when I get cut off in traffic. Uh, I'm very passionate when the uh, checker at the grocery store is slow. Uh, I think what that comes down to is I'm kind of an old Irishman with a temper. And uh, so, you know, getting excited about stuff is easy. And uh, Walter Burt, some of you know Walter, he sent me a message not too long ago and he said, keep fighting the good fight. And I told us that's easy advice to give to an old Irishman. You know, um, I, I I do tend to to fight and argue uh, uh, pretty strongly, and uh, I think that's just because I'm stubborn. Um, but if you take a negative word and turn it into a positive, like passionate, then then it becomes a good thing. So, but you know, I I think too the idea of kind of getting things done, the idea of taking action. Uh, I've thought about that one too. And I, I do think a lot of it comes back to my parents. I came from a family with uh, clearly an alpha male and an alpha female set of parents. Uh, mom and dad were both officers during World War II. Mom was a field hospital nurse. And my dad was, well, he's a member of the US Army Ranger Hall of Fame. And the idea of addressing things, getting them done, taking action, that was always a part of our household. That was, that was an example we saw every day. And my dad was always real clear in talking to me about that, that um, the most important quality of any officer and of any person, he said, was moral courage. And uh, that's something that'll get you in trouble sometimes because it's not always what people uh, uh, appreciate. And Ashley's smiling at that. But uh, you know, I've tried to I've tried to demonstrate that I've tried to to live by that, and you know, hopefully I've been more successful than I've that I've failed in that. But I think that's where it comes from. It's uh, you know, it's just always been part of part of my upbringing. The Irish will get you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're lucky to have you doing that for sure. Um, what, can you think of anything that these guys and for the rest of you, feel free to jump in or put questions in now. I'm, I'm going through all my questions and I can keep going, but please feel free to do that. Um, can you think of anything that this audience would be surprised to learn about you? <laughs> well, uh, that you're willing to tell us. Yes, some of you know me pretty well, so you know this, but uh, you know, I mentioned before, I kind of grew up out in the country and uh, I, I, get, I get a little, uh, I'll use the word passionate about a lot of social issues and social justice issues. And then on the weekends uh, or in my days off, uh, I'm, I'm pretty likely to be out on our farm either with a chainsaw cutting stuff down that I shouldn't be cutting down or uh, hunting or, or fishing and uh, yeah, Tony's shaking her head at that one. Um, and my wife, who's also here, I think, uh, she's a Los Angeles city girl and, and uh, she's come to, to understand that. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of still, still an old farm boy too, so. Well, this was on my list of fun questions for you. Is that what, is that your favorite way to spend a day off, Mark? With the oh yeah. <laughs> Put on the boots and go out in the mud and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so have you been 
carrying into a lot during this past year when we've all been at home. I have. Here. Yep, I absolutely have. Yep. <laughs> Got a new chainsaw, in fact. That was pretty fun. Is there anything that you're um, excited about getting back to once everyone is? Oh, safe yeah. To well, home? we have four daughters and four grandkids, and uh, they're going to be kind of first on our list for visits once the once the I, I'm waiting for my second dose of vaccine. Uh, that'll be a huge relief to to have that out of the way and be able to visit again. And my students, um, I, I've got my office in Ellsworth, and for those of you who have seen my office, I've got a coffee maker in there and snacks and and uh, uh, cookies and granola bars and candy and nuts and stuff. And um, I go through probably about two or three boxes of abuelita hot chocolate a week uh, with everybody coming in. And uh, uh, I, I look forward to to being the, the barista for the program again soon and being able to see people in person and not on Zoom and, uh, you know, getting a hug now and then and just hanging out with, with students in person. I miss that a lot. Oh, hi, Damaris. <laughs> There's one of my students. There you go. I was gonna say I never got to um, experience that or like give you a <laughs> hug. So you let me know when you get the second dose. Will do. <laughs> Coming soon. So you obviously have had a great influence on students and even the staff here at Western. Um, but I am I would guess you've learned a lot from them too, the way you talk about them. So what's what are some lessons you've learned from students? Oh, man. Um, we, we, we host a, uh, a program every year, uh, Ronica, and with CETA scholars and, and the foundation scholars. Uh, and the theme is always resilience. And that's one of the qualities that the students in, in well, the three programs that I mentioned, the support for undocumented students, the, the CETA scholars for foster youth and the, the foundation scholars for people who have demonstrated great resilience. It's a quality that we have students at Western that have that in, in, uh, in a way that a uh, few other places, I think, cultivate. And, you know, the students that are here, my old kids that are here, I think you could have made-for-TV movies about any of them that would uh, be successful. Um, and, you know, watching students kind of get through the challenges of, of life is, is always fun. Um, but seeing students that have had particular challenges uh, navigate higher education, which is kind of a, a crazy disjointed world, um, is, is remarkable. And I think that uh, their stories of success um, have inspired me. And I've told them they're my heroes, you know, every day. Um, I grew up easy, you know. Uh, these guys are the ones who sort of live it every day. And I mentioned that Kayla and Bella are going to be our speakers this year. Uh, we've, we've had speakers from outside come and talk about resilience over the years. Great speakers. And uh, Ron Dillard and I, Ron was the one that kind of got this rolling. And he and I have always said, eventually we're gonna get to the point where we're just gonna have our own students come back. And Kayla and Bella are gonna be starting that. Bella, by the way, couldn't join us today because uh, she's busy uh, in her job working with uh, the young people who are showing up at the border currently. Uh, she's, she's one of the people that's dealing with that and, and helping those folks, so. Um, I told her her priorities are right to, to get the kids in and get them, get them squared away. But uh, when we have the program this fall, uh, Kayla and Bella are gonna be our first alums to come back and, and address resilience. And uh, um, actually Michael Fombang, I think will be the, uh, the following year speaker. We, we've got him lined up too. But watching students uh, overcome amazing challenges, thrive like they, like they have, uh, is great. I see Cecilia there. Uh, Cecilia also uh, 
kind of came through at a time where we were just getting programs started and she, she rocked it. So. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Mr. Gadji. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, behind you, there's a, um, a flag to your left and that's the Canadian flag. Mm -hmm. What's the flag to your right? Ireland. I'm sorry, Ireland, no doubt. Ireland, yeah. Okay, yeah. now, and right behind you, there's a photograph of some students, I would assume. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Pick out one or two and tell me about them. Anyway, oh, man. Your choice, your choice. Uh, well, if I wish I could show you the picture, but right in the middle center okay. uh, is a young man by the name of Jawan Kemp. And uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Ashley, everybody who knows Jawan, uh, there was a story on Channel 7 in Detroit about him when he was a senior in high school. Uh, he was living in an abandoned home with his brother in Detroit and um, homeless, um, uh, parents completely out of the picture. And he ended up here um, in, he, he became one of our walk-ons in the Foundation Scholars Program. Like every good team, we have our scholarship athletes, we have our walk-ons. He was a very successful walk-on. Uh, Jawan came, um, he, he absolutely tore the place apart. Uh, he graduated <laughs> also with a degree in uh, finance and accounting. Uh, he is currently working with, I think it's Price Waterhouse that, that hired him. Um, he's going to be heading down to Texas soon with that. He was doing some tax work here in Kalamazoo before heading down there. But a young man that had uh, some insurmountable challenges. Uh, he had a 4 in high school, uh, despite living on his own. And, uh, you know, I can tell the story because it was on, it was on television, you know. Um, but he did great. He made it through. And, um, you know, he did, he did great. So uh, he was featured in the uh, WM New, WMU News when he graduated with a little bit about his story. Um, and, uh, you know, he thrived. He thrived with some really tough challenges coming in. Do you much follow up with your students as far as ones that you've worked with, where they are now? <laughs> Later. Is that I kind try of a scary to, yeah. thing sometimes? <laughs> yeah, uh, right, most of us. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, I'm Ashley? Brand new for this guy. Okay, this is, I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but feel free to go right ahead and, you know, follow up. You know. I, I was just saying, Mark can't get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a couple right behind you. Okay, I get it. <laughs> Your shadow, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, personally, I love it when students stay in touch, in, in contact, and, uh, sure. you know, Josh and Cecilia and, and Kayla and Richard and Ashley and, and uh, you know, so many others, yeah, stay in touch with them. And, uh, Is there a specific geographic area that your students come from? Detroit, big cities, small cities, rural areas? There's no rhyme or reason? Well, everywhere, really. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, I'd say, all of the above, really. We have uh, students in the program from some of the small northern Michigan towns where uh, opportunities are very limited and challenges are big. We have students from Grand Rapids quite often, from Detroit, from uh, big and small towns, yeah, from all over. Unfortunate situations shows no discrimination between rural and urban, suburban. They can come from any place under the sun. Mm -hmm. How many have you worked with, out of curiosity, since I just met you? Hundreds? How, How many? Ballpark. Huh? I don't need a specific number. Well, well uh, am I asking a hard question? I can change it. What? No, I, I, in terms of the, the CETA scholars okay. that uh, Tony and I taught the first year seminar class for them for, for a while. Uh, Knew most of the students in the program for several years. Uh, the different undocumented kids that came through that I met with when they were 
uh, when they were starting off and stayed in touch with them and now the CETA, or now the foundation scholars, I'd say a few hundred. Uh, that I'm a retired closely. school teacher, so often I wonder what happens to my kids five, 10, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. There's, there's one paper, student. That's always a good thing. Yeah, there's one student that was, uh, uh, he was the first student that I knew who uh, was homeless. Uh, that was a status that didn't exist. And that was back in 1987, I think. And uh, he graduated and he's, he's at Western now working on his doctorate. Uh, he came back after a, a career in business. And uh, so I, I have students that are up in their upper forties even that I've stayed in touch with. So, yeah. Like, I, Ashley, like Ashley said, it's hard to get rid of them. Should I get you in trouble and ask a question submitted by the audience? What was that? Who Who is your favorite? <laughs> Unfair question. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Just to keep myself from getting in trouble, my favorite student is Ashley Purry. Can I explain, <laughs> Can I explain why? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Richard. I got to tell you why, though. Uh, Ashley, I think I think it was now. If you want to see somebody who's not shy, look at Ashley. Uh, it was her first week on campus, brand new to Western, uh, and I'm sitting there minding my own business. This is back when I was still in financial aid, and this 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 kid kind of walks in my office. Didn't bother to stop at the front desk or anything. She walked in, and she said, uh, "Hi, you must be Mark." My name is Ashley Purry, and from now on, I'm going to be your favorite. <laughs> and uh, so it's a title she gave herself, and uh, she's earned it, you know. And when she would work with the foundation scholars, uh, she would always tell them right up front, you know, just so you guys all know, I'm Mark's favorite. So uh, it, that's Mark? her title. It's her, it's her title. So we have to give it to her. But Mark, Richard, I saw you do this. Don't worry, Richard, got you covered. So. Yeah. You're my other favorite. You too, Mark, Kayla. Yes. Mark, I remember early in the program, you would be telling me about <laughs> this student, that student, another student, this student, and you would say, oh, you know her. He's my, she's my favorite. Oh, you know him. He's my favorite. Oh, you know this one and that. They're my favorite. So yep. honestly, they're all his favorite. I'm, I mean, I know Ashley, yeah. you're probably favorite, favorite, but, but he really... <laughs> Uh, I think for yeah. working with all the diverse personalities and all the challenges, there really were no favorites. We, you know. Well, there were, but there were about 300 of them. So yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's one big group of favorites, and to make it into that group was was really something. Yeah, that's one of my. Um, can I say something? I said like Mark. I mean, with all that many people, but Mark. I, I don't know how he does it, but when he's talking to you, you know, he made you feel like he, you got all of his attention, nothing in the world that matters. What you are saying, you know, what you have in mind is so that like, he makes each one of us feel special that, you know, all of us are his favorite. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you are. <laughs> I love that. So we're getting close to when we will have to say goodbye. So if anyone has other questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Oh, there's the other Carolyn. Could, could I jump in with something? Of One course. of the questions you didn't ask me. Yeah. Uh, you, you had asked, you know, who, who on campus here, what other employees influenced me. And I did want to answer that one, actually, uh, especially because I see one of them here. Um, Martha Warfield, I love Martha. Uh, in terms of a mentor, oh, Dr. Warfield, you're, uh, I would just kind of wander over her, to her office every once in a while and get sort of the, uh, the unofficial counseling from her. But uh, if you wanted a funny story, there was one time I remember my, my uh, passion was flaring up at a meeting in the president's conference room and she was sitting directly across the table from me and uh, someone said something, we'll just say foolish. And I think my mouth might have even opened to say something. And she was sitting directly across from me and her, lies were, her eyes were locked on mine. And I can remember 
imperceptibly, she went. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was telling me, don't say it, Mark. <laughs> and I didn't. And uh, I think she bailed me out a few times in situations like that where she would uh, sort of silently remind me to, to zip it. So uh, Can I say something? a tremendous influence and just, yeah, I, I want to be like her when I grow up. <laughs> Can I say just one more story, if I may? Um, there a lot of people on campus really helped us from the beginning and throughout the whole uh, this whole series, this whole years of, of success. There was a lady off campus that I came to know through Mark and I had met her, but um, her, she was the tip lady. And one of the things that we, one of the challenges we had early on was getting the word out about this program so that we could begin to serve students, letting the guidance counselor community know Carolyn was a part of that and um, tailoring our presentations so that we were talking about the program and introducing it to people. But the tip lady literally went top to bottom, stem to stern, east to west, throughout the state. And every single high school she visited and people knew her and trusted her, she started talking about this program and lifting us up in the guidance community and the financial aid community. Mark knew her very, very well. I came to know her very well. She was an awesome, colleague, not related, not affiliated directly with Western, but she really worked hard for us and was a great uh, support. Yeah. Well, Jennifer Wallace is, is one of my big sisters. And uh, I want to, another person I wanted to mention along with, along with Martha was most of the things that, uh, that I got credit for, for starting actually started when I would walk across the, the lobby of fonts, walk into his office and say, hey, Vernon, you got a minute? I have an idea. Uh, okay. Vernon Payne was one of those people too that uh, was a was just another mentor in terms of kind of explaining how things work to me. And, you know, uh, a tremendous, uh, tremendous support for, uh, for all kinds of change and another one of my mentors. Um, a third person I wanted to mention, Jan Vanderclay, uh, Vice President of Business and Finance now, but uh, she has like an, an encyclopedic memory of the university and would always explain things to me in a way that I could kind of figure out politically sort of who was where to, to figure out how to make things happen. And I see, uh, I see too, Tony uh, Wolfork Barnes and Ronica Hamilton uh, will stick within the family. Uh, Tony's my little sister and Ronica and I uh, have called each other husband and wife for, for a long time because we realized that we had, uh, Ronica is the head of the CETA Scholars Program, and we realized we had about 100 kids in common. And since we had all these kids in common, we should be married. So <laughs> that explains that. So I'm sorry, the, what other questions did you have, Carolyn? <laughs> I think the other Carolyn had a question maybe. Oh. Yes, um, you, you mentioned that you had selected foundation scholars. How many people are in the program a freshman year? How many foundation scholars and CETA scholars and DACA students? Well, we have uh, 10 foundation scholars every year and hopefully we'll be able to build that tremendously in the next few years. That's a small start that we wanna, we wanna expand. Uh, Ronica, you wanna address the the numbers in CETA currently. We st I, a quick story about that though. The first year we started it, when when Penny and Yvonne and I got it rolling, we hoped to have fifteen. We hoped to have fifteen students. That was our goal. We had it completely backwards. We ended up with fifty-one that year. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have we currently have ninety-one students. Uh, and that's because during the fall semester, some graduated. So we started out the school year with 110 students. And we anticipate starting out this coming fall with about 125 students. Is that total for the four years or is that the freshman class? Is the 125 total for four years? Yes. So every year, 
as students graduate, that's what, you know, gives us room, if you will, to have other students come in. So our capacity is about 125 students based on budget, the number of campus coaches that we have to support students, et cetera. Does that answer your question, Carolyn? Yes, it does. And Mark, okay. you said that the program was self-sufficient. Can you explain that? Absolutely. With the uh... With the CETA scholars, the way we were able to kind of get it going financially was uh, just a, a few points that that were were made about it up front. Um, the capacity of the university, we have room for more students, and at a university, the costs of educating students uh, is pretty much fixed. The cost, whether we had you know twenty four thousand students or twenty four thousand and fifty, the cost of running the university was going to be the same. Uh, and so what we looked at was, what I said was, if we, if we just wave tuition, uh, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, the question, how many foster youth would be able to enroll at Western without any support? And the answer for all practical purposes was none. If we have no students enrolling, our revenue is zero. Uh, if we help students enroll by allowing them to have uh, free tuition, it doesn't increase the cost at all. And when they enroll in with Pell Grant and uh, education draining voucher and other uh, aid, and they can pay for the room and board and their books and, and everything else, that's positive revenue for the university. So it was, uh, it was set up that it wasn't going to cost the university anymore. Uh, the revenue from uh, the funds that they brought with them from other sources was going to be positive. So it didn't take away from any other students. It didn't take away from any other scholarship program. It didn't take away from uh, resources of other departments. It was, uh, it was something that paid for itself. Now, the, the funds from, uh, from room and board and things that the students would pay, that then can help offset the costs of uh, uh, hiring staff and things. Plus, you know, the large gifts that we've received from the Kellogg Foundation and others. Uh, it's a program that really literally does pay for itself. So the room, is the room and board then covered by gifts, charitable gifts? Well, given? most of the students have education training voucher of $4,000 a year and their Pell Grants. So is there a need for charitable contributions to this specific program or are there other... For, for, for CETA scholars? Yes. There's always a need for, for funding, <laughs> always a need. And for a lot of the additional things that students need, for the foundation scholars, for example, uh, I, uh, Ronica and I will uh, arm wrestle here over, you know, over needs. The, the needs in both programs are, are tremendous, um, but trying to increase the number of, uh, of students receiving the scholarships are important and the funding can help with that for the for the foundation side of things. Uh, support for uh, when we need to have, you know, for, for some of the trips and things like that that we take, that support is absolutely uh, needed. I think Carolyn is gonna talk about the, the uh, giving day, right? The other right, Carolyn? I can that definitely can... do that. And I was gonna say, I know okay. there are a couple more questions um, and maybe you can answer those after, but as people are, needing to leave, I want to make sure that you have a chance to give final thoughts and to talk about that. So I, so you all know, we will be celebrating a virtual alumni spirit week um, in a couple weeks. So we want you to keep an eye out for that kind of thing. But part of that week also is our giving day. So we'll let Mark tell you what, <laughs> what kinds of things they need. But I, in order to address that, I would guess I would just ask, um, Hardy put in here, how many, you have 10 foundation scholars every year, which is how many applicants. And so how do you expand those scholarships? And then if I can add on to that for you to address, how can, I guess, what, what do you want us most to know about your kids? And how can we as alumni help with that program? Did I give yeah. you a <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, f first of all, uh, 
I think uh, Jordan can can uh, vouch for the fact that I tell all the students in the foundation program, every one of them, that when they, you know, graduate and make it big, they're going to write a nice check back to the university to pay for some more people after them. And I've always told them they graduate with no loans, but they do graduate with a debt. And so uh, our students are going to uh, keep this going in the future, our graduates. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we do need more scholarships. You know, we had over 100 applicants this year and we could award it to 10. And, uh, you know, probably the first 35, 40 students, the, the top 35, 40 students, uh, all would have been wonderful students for the university. And if I can say something about that too, this is our seventh cohort that we're going to be bringing in in the program. And it's clear from, uh, from who we're going to get this year that for the seventh year in a row, all seven years, the average GPA of the students entering in this program is above 4.0. The average GPA is above four for students who are coming in and the circumstances they have to meet, they have to either be homeless, wards of the state, undocumented, or from families receiving free lunch. Uh, and like I said, they're, they're all graduating with honors and Phi Beta Kappa and presidential scholars and things. Um, if we could have more, that would certainly be good uh, to be able to sponsor the trips that we take uh, for some of the other events. Uh, we can always use the funding. Um, we have students that need to take classes in summer that uh, if they need to take a summer class to continue on to so they can graduate in four years, uh, being able to take a summer class isn't covered by the scholarship. Uh, having funds available to pay for, for that summer class, that's crucial for keeping people on track. So, you know, the needs are, the needs are tremendous. Um, I put Josh on the spot a little while ago, but uh, another thing that uh, students in the program really could use uh, are internship opportunities and employment opportunities. Uh, students coming from uh, some of these backgrounds might not have some of the same skills in terms of uh, interviewing that others would have. And to be able to kind of have students get a little bit of a break on, uh, on being hired uh, during internship opportunities, that would be fantastic. Um, let's help them get a foot in the door and they'll, they'll take it from there, so. Good deal, thank you. Well, I, I know a lot of people are going to have to leave. I, let's, let's try this one more time. I will show you, can, can we see it any better? Better. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I will, uh, we'll stay on for a minute. I don't know how much time Mark has. I know he has some meetings with students today that we dragged him out of, so I won't force you to stick around, but I, I do wanna, before anyone else has to leave, just say thank you all for coming.